and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. COVID-19 continues to spread across the country and some of the highest numbers over the last few weeks are coming from rural counties where farming and ranching is a way of life. We know that you have questions about COVID-19 that are unique to rural America. So tonight we're gonna open up our phone lines and give you a chance to talk to the experts who have been at the forefront of the crisis. 877-731. 6733 is the number to call. You are a big part of this show. Join the conversation tonight. Again, that number is 877-731-6733. And joining us live tonight from Omaha, Nebraska, is University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor and world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Superintendent of Blair Community Schools in Nebraska. Dr. Randy Gilson joins us as well. Thank you both for being here. Dr. Gold, let's get right to it and start with an overview of how widespread COVID-19 is in rural America tonight. Well, Christina, we continue to see a fairly rapid rise in the number of cases across the United States. As a matter of fact, uh, over the weekend, uh, we've seen well over 60,000 new confirmed cases per day. We reached 70,000 late last week. Uh, and so we're well over 3.5 million confirmed cases uh, across the United States, rapidly approaching 4 million. Tragically, we've now exceeded 140,000 deaths uh, directly related uh, to COVID-19 as well. And what we've seen, uh, in spite of the fact that the generation of individuals, particularly that we're now seeing in Florida, Texas, Arizona, California, and other hotspots across the United States was a younger cohort uh, in the 25 to 45 year age group. What we're starting to see now across the country, regrettably, uh, is an uptick in the number of reported deaths per day. And I interpret that as a beginning of a demographic change of seeing the older individuals uh, because of connections to their children and grandchildren now getting COVID getting hospitalized and starting to see the unfortunate tragic sequelae of that, which is ICU care placement on a ventilator when critically important, and then uh, a small percentage, but a definite percentage uh, are unable uh, to survive that. It hasn't changed the, uh, the fact that the older generation and those that are more vulnerable due to diabetes and high blood pressure and heart disease and lung disease are, are the most at risk. But there was recently a report that came out of a large county in Texas, I believe it was Corpus Christi area, of uh, 85 neonates, 85 newborn children with confirmed cases of COVID, including tragically at least one and possibly more deaths that actually occurred in that age group. And so, uh, you know, the, the concept of that our younger children are pretty well immune and invincible to this disease is proven over and over again to not be accurate. Indeed, there was just another really good report that came out that said that children ages 10 to 15, which of course, Christina, is everything we're gonna be talking about today, that that age group, the 10 to 15, 10 to 18 year old age group, are not only uh, able to get COVID, but are in an age group where they are the highest transmitters of the disease. One, they're mobile, Secondly, they may not have the very best hand hygiene or personal protective equipment, masking practices, but they carry the disease to their parents and to their grandparents. And so that's really timely that we have this conversation today about getting back to school. And hopefully we'll have an opportunity to talk about vaccines and everything else related to COVID today. And hopefully you'll have some good news for us on that front as well. Dr. Gilson, we're going to unpack students returning to school. We're going to weigh the pros and the cons tonight. But let's start with your story in your district as a superintendent. Describe what this experience has been like for you so far. You know, our students were at spring break last March and um, they never had the opportunity to return back to school. And so um, when uh, you know, uh, when spring break finished, um, we, I made the announcement that we were going to close school and not return. 
Um, and so it's going to be five, almost six months for our students to not have live learning with our teachers. So it's been devastating for students. It's been difficult for teachers as well. Now, I'm proud of our staff. Um, we didn't really miss a day of continuity instruction. Our staff started preparing through um, a lot of their work in a, in, inside of a professional learning community um, to uh, introduce an e-learning um, or a remote learning plan to students and families upon their return from spring break. And we started feeding students um, a day after, which would have been the eventual return from spring break. So um, I'm proud of our staff, but um, it's, we really, we're hopeful that we can have 100% um, return of students in August um, and school can be as normal as, uh, you know, it, and safe as possible. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight, what that looks like. And many parents might actually feel like they're a part of your staff right now as they try to educate their children at home so that they can step away. They have to actually have that plan to get back into the workforce. They're also worried, though, that if their kids go to school, if you reach that 100% goal like you're talking about, they're worried that their kids might possibly bring home the virus. We just heard from Dr. Gold that they're carriers. How do you reconcile those two situations and this process as you make key decisions right now about reopening in a matter of weeks? So why don't I start, and then we can pass this back and forth a little bit, and I'm sure there'll be some good questions from our audience tonight on this matter. The university has been pretty clear that there needs to be reasonable amount of control of the virus spread, what we call the transmission factors or the R factors, in the local community. And what I mean by that, that if the virus is raging in the local community for any reason, be it coming out of a long-term care facility, a meatpacking facility, or just community spread in the, in the, in the local area of unknown uh, causes, uh, that it almost is going to be impossible to open schools if we have prevalence rates that are really high and transmission rates that are really high. Now, if that's not the case, as of course is the case where, where Blair is, uh, you're located today, and hopefully it remains that way, it then comes down to what the school is going to do and whether you can maintain social distancing, whether you can maintain appropriate masking policies and other things. And so that would really be a good point to identify how we could uh, begin that conversation at the school level, but in the context of what's happening in the local community. Well, I think so much depends on local variables. Like, for example, um, in our community, we just have had 71 cases. Um, and so we've had a low... In the, in the whole season. In the, in the whole season. Mm -hmm. And so low number, and we've had less than 10 in um, the age group you talked about, um, 19 or under. So um, the risks are lower, and that's why I'm a little more confident that we can come back to school and, and have a, a plan to mitigate the risk. I don't think we're ever going to completely eliminate the risk, but I think we can develop a plan to mitigate the risk and get our students... Um, back in school. But another factor um, for so many rural communities is total enrollment and then their class sizes. So while we're a, a rural community, we're located just 30 minutes away from Omaha, and our class sizes are larger. They're between 21 and 25. And so that presents some challenges um, in maintaining physical distancing. One of the keys for us is um, screening and educating parents about screening at home. We've made a purchase of infrared screeners that are remote, um, and we've, we have 22 students, 2,200 students in our district, so we'll place that at all of the entrances, and we'll vary entrances, so we'll be able to um, take every student and staff member's temperature upon entry. Of course, an alarm would sound off if um, their temperature was over 100.4, and that would give us an opportunity to um, begin to you know, intervene and contact um, a nurse and contact home. And so those are one of the safety measures. But I guess to answer your question is how many safety measures can we put in place? Universal face masking policy is another one um, that I'm sure we'll talk more about throughout the show. Yeah, in fact, that's actually our next question. Leaving us off tonight, we've got Bob in northern Louisiana. He has a question about whether or not a unified effort from all of us will make a difference in reopening economies and getting a handle on the virus. Let's listen to what he has to say. If everyone would just wear a mask, 
do you think we would be able to keep our rural economies open? Yeah, so uh, I, I agree with you, Bob. Uh, I think your question is right on. You know, until we have an effective vaccine and until we have a curative antiviral, and I'm much more confident on the vaccine side than I am on the curative antiviral side tonight, uh, we are going to have to rely on these non-pharmacologic measures in order to protect ourselves, protect our families, and protect our communities. And that's everything from personal protective equipment, which of course means wearing a mask, social distancing or physical distancing as I prefer to call it, because we want to be socially connected even though we're physically distant, uh, surface sanitizing, uh, hand uh, hygiene, all of the things that we have talked about over and over again that we all know are common sense ways not to get the flu, not to get exposed to any other uh, viruses or, or, or other infectious agents, and most importantly, uh, not to get COVID-19. You know, I don't need to tell you, Bob, uh, that these are widely known and widely accepted practices, and whether or not we have consistent messaging at the government level or at the county level or at the city level, uh, these are the only things, frankly, that are going to help us stay healthy, you and I, which of course we want, uh, and also help us get our economy back going, to get our farms and ranches fully productive, and to get us back to school. So, I mean, if I had a single message to share with our audience tonight, it would be to take care of yourself and take care of each other through these non-pharmacologic interventions. And that's how we're going to have the highest chance of restoring our economy and the highest chance of getting back to school in the fall. Yeah, inconsistent messaging. That is something that we've all had a little frustration with, I'm sure, at some point. Our next viewer of question comes from Lisa. She's in South Carolina, and she writes on social media, we've been given the option to send our kids back to school or to continue remote learning on the farm in August. Now, if we send them back, I feel like they'll be sent home again. What are your greatest concerns about kids returning to the classroom? Yeah, why don't I start, uh, and, and then I'll ask Dr. Gilson to give us the real answer. But uh, uh, Lisa, you know, I think it's inevitable that no matter how many precautions we put into place in going back to school this fall, that the day is going to come that the first child or sibling or parent is going to get diagnosed with COVID-19. And that's going to produce an immediate question of how we're going to deal with that. And, uh, and, uh, and obviously, you know, as I like to say, uh, one tree does not a forest make. Uh, one case may not be uh, the question about whether a school or a cohort or a grouping uh, is, is closed. But uh, have you given that much thought? I'm sure you have as to what the thresholds might be here and how you might deal with them. Because Lisa's question is really right on. Is it worth sending my child or children back to school uh, knowing that there's a chance, and not a, not a zero chance by any means, that uh, they may have to come back? Well, that's a great question. And one of the things we've really focused on is working with our local health director, um, Tara Ewing. And we're requiring all of our administrators, our nurses, and our counselors to have contact tracing prior to the reopening of school. And also, we haven't finalized our reopening plans. And so many of those administrators have already had contact tracing, um, which the reason I bring that out is because um, if we can establish good protocol, um, we might be able to prevent you know, long-term school closures if there was a case. Our goal is to really be able to contact trace, and one of the strategies we'll use is cohort grouping. And what cohort grouping means, and, and, and it's easier, more easily done in an elementary school, um, is that one, uh, as a student stays with the same group of 20 to 24, throughout the day. It might mean they have an assigned entrance, an assigned exit, that they have a homeroom teacher, and um, they also travel, whether it be to recess or to the PE, their specials um, courses to lunch within that cohort. Then if there's an infection, um, it might just mean that uh, we would have to quarantine part of the cohort or the whole court and then disinfect and do contact tracing on the with cohort. contact tracing. Mm -hmm. Universal face uh, coverings is another strategy. Um, if that cohort was wearing a mask or was able to 
maintain physical distancing throughout the day. It might mean that the cohort could even return back to school the next day. Um, if we get a lot of intermingling and if there's um, not careful planning, um, it could result in, um, you know, a, not only a school closure, but it, it could even increase into a district closure. And again, where our cases are low right now, we're real ho really hopeful that with the right safety precautions. So the community risk is low right mm -hmm. now. Yes. So it really is up to putting the right programs and right policies in place in the schools. Yep. Boy, Dr. Gillison, I could not even imagine how hard it must be to be in your shoes right now. This has not been an easy time for anybody, but when you have to make these big decisions, and I know we're giving you the hard questions tonight, but people are trying to look out for their kids and get as much information as they can. So I'm wondering if a teacher has to isolate, say for 14 days, I can't imagine it's gonna be easy to get as a substitute teacher to fill in in a classroom where cases may have been positively identified or would the teacher just isolate with the cohort? Have you guys put too much thought into that or any thought into that? Yeah, the, how we would address um, if, a, if a teacher was uh, quarantined for 14 days, first question we would ask is if the teacher would be able to continue to teach remotely um, if they are, then we could uh, possibly put a substitute into that cohort um, classroom and continue uh, learning with the teacher. Now, if the teacher was uh, not in a position where they could continue to instruct remotely, um, then we would ask that they apply for the FFCA, which would allow them um, two weeks of full paid pay, and we would just you know work with the teacher and modify plans from there. Um, you're correct. I mean, there's just not a lot of substitutes available anyway. And um, with, you know, with uh, the availability of subs comes risk in terms of you got age and different thing, variables like that. Um, but the plan that we would implement would be we, the first we'd hope um, using uh, Zoom and distance learning options that, you know, the, the one nice part about last year and, and being closed was all of our teachers had a chance to um, learn and, and use live learning through, um, you know, remote means. Um, we're also, in our district, all of our students have a computer, um, but in some districts, I know that's a, that becomes a difficult challenge, a financial restriction. It was a financial restriction for our district, but our local bank, um, Washington County Bank, donated computers, and then we also did a fundraiser, to, and uh, fortunately, we do have a computer for every student. Wow, that, that is outstanding. Really appreciate that donation as well, especially in a time like this. That really says a lot. Remember, our phone lines are open. We'd love to hear from you tonight. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. I'm going to give you that number one more time. I said it kind of fast. I'm going to slow it down. 877-731-6733. We know you have questions about COVID-19. We are going to get to your calls on the other side of this break. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us live tonight from Omaha, Nebraska, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor and world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Superintendent of Blair Community Schools in Nebraska, Dr. Randy Gilson. Our next question comes from Emily. She's looking for some good news on the vaccine front. Let's listen. I was wondering if the timeline on an approved vaccine has changed at all. Emily, the news on the vaccine front is good news tonight, and it has been good news for a while, but it gets progressively better uh, each week. So currently, all in, there are probably between 135 and 145 vaccines being developed worldwide. Uh, of those, uh, there are probably uh, between 15 and 20 that are in phase one trials, which are safety trials, and there are now uh, three uh, that are in clinical trials, and I am told that by the end of the month, there'll be actually eight in clinical trials. Now, uh, you know, if, if you've read the recent announcements uh, from the Moderna group and from the AstraZeneca group, there is some very good data coming out that not only does it appear that there's preliminary safety uh, of these uh, vaccines, and they're quite different between these two companies, but that actually... Uh, 
that they're effective. And what I mean by that is that in the small number of individuals, which in one of these trials was approximately, I think, 45 uh, individuals, that they are able to induce the development of uh, what are called neutralizing antibodies. <clears throat> these are antibodies that are made by our white cells, by our B cells, that are specific to this virus and are able to actually kill the virus <clears throat> in laboratory tests and hopefully they will be effective in large trials. You know, uh, it's so interesting, as long as we're on the vaccine subject right now, if you wanted to do a uh, efficacy trial uh, in China today, it would be almost impossible because of the very small number of cases. But if you wanted to do a efficacy trial in Arizona or in Florida or in Texas today, you know, where we were, these states are reporting somewhere around 10,000 uh, new confirmed cases per day, it would be a lot faster to do that efficacy trial. And so I am optimistic that as tragic as what's going on in the United States is right now, there are going to be parts of the United States that it would be possible to accelerate the clinical so-called phase three efficacy testing. Now, I'm very proud of the fact that the University of Nebraska has entered into an agreement uh, to participate as a site in one of the new developing uh, vaccines as well. And we've also talked about some of our antibody testing, which actually, Christine, I think is a very important point because no matter how effective the vaccines are and how long they last, people are going to be asking the question is, uh, am I immune? Can I get the virus, you know, in six months? nine months, 12 months from now. And that's where the testing is going to become important. As this graphic shows, there are still large parts of the United States that we need to ramp up access to both PCR testing and ultimately to antibody testing as well so that we can confirm that folks are still immune. Uh, it's, it's our hope that these vaccines that are being tested now uh, will last a long time, meaning years, and that the immunity that is produced uh, will be something that goes into our permanent uh, immunologic system memory so that if we're challenged by this virus again next year or two years, unless it really mutates into a totally different appearing virus, that will have sustained immunity. And uh, that would be the hope. You know, these large companies, they're gearing up to manufacture not hundreds or thousands of doses, but actually tens of millions, if not even a hundred million doses of these, uh, of these vaccines, because that's what it's going to take to get the right cohort uh, immunized. So yeah, you know, uh, Emily, uh, I'm uh, a more than minimally optimistic, and I'm hoping, as I said before, uh, sometime before uh, Santa comes down the chimney, that we've got a number <laughs> of very promising looking uh, vaccine products ready to deploy. Boy, that would make a lot of people's Christmas extra special this year, Dr. Gold. And, and you think about at that point, December, dealing with the virus in December, that's already tough to think about Christmas. But you know what? Light at the end of the tunnel is something. You touched on this a little bit, but I was wondering if you'd elaborate a little bit for us. UNMC is doing some vaccine research, and this is super exciting. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit more about it, Dr. Gold. Sure. Well, uh, we signed a, uh, an, a preliminary agreement uh, just recently uh, with a U.S. firm uh, uh, known as COVAX, that's C-O-V-A-X-X. -X. And uh, COVAX is, uh, and their parent company is one of the largest manufacturers of vaccines in the world, but most of their vaccine products are for domestic uh, animals and actually for livestock. And they produce, <clears throat> I'm told, uh, north of 500 million doses of vaccine a year. And they have shifted their efforts to the development of a human vaccine now, specifically uh, for COVID-19. And they're going into clinical trials uh, early on uh, in August, uh, actually in Taiwan, I believe. And shortly thereafter, they're going to be doing phase one, phase two clinical trials in the United States. And we're very proud uh, to have an opportunity uh, to be partnered with them uh, to help test the safety and efficacy of uh, this vaccine uh, in the U.S. You know, as everybody knows, it's not going to be a single company or a single vaccine that's going to move us forward. It's going to be a whole bunch of different companies with different types of vaccines, different types of specificities, different types of scalability. 
But, you know, a company that can manufacture 500 million doses of vaccine in a year, I mean, that's a lot of vaccine. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully uh, these trials will turn out to be successful. And that's another nice thing about this relationship is this is purely based on the science of the trial and that we go into this as an academic medical center specifically to answer the question of is it safe and does it work? And while we have preliminary information in the laboratory that yes, it will be safe and yes, it does work, until we actually do the research, it's going to be very hard to know. And so uh, we look forward to kicking that off uh, in the near future. And it just speaks volumes to the importance, the key role that UNMC has played throughout. Our next question comes from a Tennessee educator. KT left us a message on the Rural Health Hotline. Let's listen. Hi, I'm wondering, can you give any guidance for teachers who are returning to school next month? We'll be setting up our classrooms over the next two weeks, and then students are set to return um, early August. Uh, Kelly, you know, that's a great question. And <clears throat> one of the things that uh, we've done here at the Med Center is we've developed a playbook. Uh, you know, we call it a checklist or a guide. But the truth of the matter is it's not a prescription or a mandate, but it's, I think last time I, I checked, it was like 23 or 25 pages long. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in it. But uh, it tries to provide some useful information for classroom spacing, social distancing, use of protective equipment, sanitizers, air handling, air exchanges. Uh, you know, uh, what do you think, Randy? Is, is that the kind of thing that you folks are looking at in Blair? Yeah, Kelly, I'd recommend for sure looking um, at UNMC's, the playbook resource that they have to offer. It's outstanding. It provides a lot of useful information, again, in a checklist format that you can adapt to your classroom. Um, one of the things that, you know, we've looked at and you'll find it in the playbook is, is anytime you can engineer or, uh, to remove a risk, and they talk a lot about that in the playbook, um, I think it's, it's a good strategy. For example, if we can keep doors open. Now, we've been taught recently to lock doors, keep them closed, but what we're telling our staff is if you can keep doors open, uh, maybe it's only the teacher that opens, the, that touches the handle. Um, light switches, um, we actually had engineered so that they're on sensors in our district, but if they're not on sensors in your district, it just would be something that, the, again, the teacher would be the only person using. Um, and then we've just stressed the importance to families and students to bring their own classroom materials and not share. I think the challenge is, is um, can you create barriers for small group learning if, uh, you're not, if your district's not requiring um, face coverings? Um, but I would start with um, the playbook that uh, UNMC has published, and that'd be a great place to start. So, Randy, is kindergarten different than high school? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's a great question, and it has its differences because um, I think it's easier to physical distance students in an older setting. And I think other countries that we've learned from that's reopened um, earlier, um, they, they open slowly, uh, really focusing on creating space for um, elementary and K-8 age groups and maybe didn't open high school up until later on. Um, I, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a lot easier to keep a high school age student um, six feet apart, um, keep a mask on them, um, again, if that's what your district's policy, as opposed to a kindergarten student that is so mobile. And um, the kindergarten classroom looks so much different today than it did um, 20, even 10 years ago. We've really um, try to focus on collaboration of students, movement of students, and really to take advantage of all of their different learning styles and modalities. And so it's going to be a drastic shift for educators to move into maybe a more of an isolated state, and that will be, uh, there'll be a big learning curve for all of so us. So you have a daughter going into kindergarten, right? Yeah, my <laughs> daughter starts kindergarten, and we're excited to have her start school. Um, but it'll look different for her than it did for our kindergarten group starting last year. Yeah. My mom's a retired kindergarten teacher, and we've had discussions about what it would be like if she were continuing on this year and going back to school. One of her biggest concerns is recess because kids might behave in the classroom to a degree, but then they get outside and it's woo, freewheeling time. What are your plans for recess? That's a great question. Um, we're really going to try to, in, in the elementary, focus on 
cohort groups um, where uh, those students, you know, in the past we've had recess with um, hundreds of students out at the same time. And now we're planning um, recess on a schedule um, where cohorts can grow, go out together. Um, we'll have staff clean the equipment after use um, and before each use. Um, and then we'll just have to be careful with sharing um, balls and different sorts of equipment that way. But that's the strategy. It, recess is important, just like physical education, music, all those different um, educational opportunities are important. So we plan to continue to have it, but it's just it's going to look different. Um, I think, in, and Dr. Gold would be the expert on this area, but being outside, um, it's, uh, there, there's more opportunity for students. Um, you know, well, again, the six foot uh, distancing, physical distancing is important, but um, I think being outside might mediate some of the risk. Sure, absolutely. All right, next up is Henrietta of Oregon. She writes on social media. We grow potatoes outside of Pendleton, and coronavirus is spreading here. My husband has needed to see a foot doctor for months. Should we travel to another county? Well, Henrietta, I would uh, call your local doctor, clinic, or wherever that, uh, that you would want your husband to be seen and ask what their practices are in terms of, uh, of being seen. So if they're using 100% uh, uh, face masks, if they're limiting the number of people in the waiting room, so for instance, what a lot of clinics have done what we've done is we ask people to wait in their cars and we call them up on their cell phone and say we're ready to go. So there's no cohort grouping <clears throat> that goes on. I would say that would be pretty low risk. And I would certainly advise uh, you and your husband uh, to not defer medical care. And, you know, we call that the second pandemic. Uh, these are people that uh, are having, you know, chest pain or their diabetes is not under good control or they've deferred their mammograms or their, you know, cardiac casts or stress tests, things that they would normally do uh, for good care. And we're starting to see the consequences of that, of people showing up in emergency rooms with emergent, urgent situations for which they normally would have had routine care for that they've deferred. Now, I would say if your husband, let's say, needed a surgical procedure or needed a scan or something like that uh, due to whatever the problem turned out to be, that would be a good question uh, to be sure that they're testing patients. Uh, for instance, in our ambulatory surgery centers that, that we run here at the university, we test every single outpatient under 72 hours uh, before they're actually seen or cared for uh, in, the, in the clinic, in the surgical suite, procedural suite, uh, et cetera. And, you know, uh, all of this could change tomorrow. But we haven't had a single acquired case, and we've been doing this now since, what, February. Uh, it's been, uh, you know, a, a really, really long time. Just making the point that you can do it safely. All right. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Fred in Arkansas, he asks on social media, we're retired rice farmers in northeast Arkansas. For seniors like us worried about getting the virus, do you have any suggestions for boosting immunity or lung health? Sure. Well, uh, you know, there are a couple of very practical suggestions that boost immunity, uh, you know, until we get a, uh, you know, a, an effective and safe uh, vaccine. Uh, the first and simplest things that you can do is uh, get an adequate amount of rest, uh, eat a balanced diet. Uh, if for some reason your diet is not rich in a good spectrum of different vitamins and minerals, I'm a strong believer in supplementing your diet with vitamins uh, if you if you need it. I mean, if you get a good balance of fruit and vegetables, which most people can get, then it's not necessary. Uh, be very sensitive uh, to people around you who may be ill for one reason or another. And then there's some recent research uh, that talks uh, about the innate immunity system. And that came from the fact that there was an observational study done that showed that children that got BCG immunized for tuberculosis, which is something we don't do in this country, but is still done in other parts of the world, in Europe and in uh, Middle Asia and other places, that there was almost no evidence of any viral disease, be it flu, be it RSV, be it COVID in, in, you know, in recent years, 
recent months uh, in, in that age group. And so the thought was that the use of BCG or in other recent studies, oral polio vaccine or even MMR vaccines, uh, which are commonly used in the childhood age group, produce a boost to what's called your innate immunity system. And there are a number of good studies that are going on right now uh, around the world, particularly in Europe and, uh, and elsewhere, and hopefully soon in the United States, specifically to answer the question as to whether that is, a, is an effective thing to do. And the reason being is that these vaccines, particularly oral polio vaccine or, uh, or many of these others, are widely available. They're very inexpensive. They've been around for decades. We know that they're safe. And they may not produce a permanent fix, but they may be able to buy us some time until a specific vaccine of the type that we were just talking about a few minutes ago becomes available. So I think that's another point for being optimistic. Yeah, almost like a bridge. That's fantastic. Tom from Colorado is up next. Thanks for joining the conversation. Tom, go right ahead. Yes, uh, I was wondering, uh, Dr. Gold, can phase three trials be shortened by any means? Yeah, Tom, uh, you know, that's a really good question. And uh, the answer to the question is yes. Uh, it has to do with the communities in which you test the vaccine. And so if you need, let's say, 10,000 individuals or 20,000 individuals to do a phase three trial, if you're looking at a community like Arizona or Texas or Florida, you can do the trial a lot faster uh, than you can do, uh, for instance, in Nebraska, where we have a much smaller population, but we also have a much lower test positivity rate. The, you know, the test positivity rates in those communities are in the mid to high 20s right now. Uh, we're testing out at around 6 to 8 percent positive across the state of Nebraska. Uh, they have 10,000 new cases a day. We have 100 to 200 new cases per day. And so by focusing some of the testing in these highly uh, infected rapid transmission areas, the other thing that can be done, and you know, this is, gets into a rather difficult ethical conversation, is there may be some individuals, particularly young and healthy individuals, that would actually volunteer to participate in a trial in which they'd be willing to expose to the virus if they were immunized and see what the chances of them getting infected are with a placebo and with an active ingredient. Now, there are all kinds of ethical considerations, and those are called challenge trials. And right now, nobody's talking about doing a challenge trial, and the reason being is there's more than enough activity of viral spread in various parts of the United States, in South America, in the subcontinent, in India, uh, and in other parts of the world. And so uh, hopefully that won't be necessary. Uh, not because of the safety of it, but because of the complex ethics that are involved. But if we absolutely had to, and in answer your question, Tom, that would definitely accelerate our route uh, towards a, uh, an answer of whether a vaccine, you wouldn't want to do it for a safety trial, but you would definitely want to do it for an efficacy trial if you needed to. All right, good question, Tom. Thank you for that call. We're going to pause for a quick break, but our phone lines are open. We still have time for your question. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again is University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor and world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Superintendent of Blair Community Schools in Nebraska. We are also joined by a wonderful doctor tonight and we're very lucky to have him. So we are going to start with Sherry of Wyoming. She says, my grandkids are going back to school next month after being isolated with us all summer in rural Wyoming, do you think it's okay to see them on the weekends after they return to the classroom? Well, that's a really great question. And it's one we get asked even about university students all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've thought about that, uh, you know, particularly not just, you know, grandparents, uh, aunts, uncles, et cetera, family gatherings. Uh, have you thought about giving the, some advice to these families as to, 
you know, what they should be doing in terms of, you know, family get-togethers, birthday celebrations, you know, uh, Labor Day weekend, for instance, is coming up on the calendar all too quick. I think just uh, continue to stay in contact with your teacher, your school. Um, you know, our teachers are so caring and, and so um, understanding and understand the, uh, it's, it's so much relationship building between our students and our kids. But I think it's just communicating to the teacher, um, especially if there's travel like out of state. Um, but, you know, just checking symptoms. Um, well, we ask our parents to check symptoms before kids, you know, return to school each morning um, and watch those, monitor those symptoms throughout, you know, the weekend. Um, good hygiene practices, which again, we'll be promoting in school and the carry over into the home. I know that that, that will be important. Um, and like I said, in our district, we're going to um, screen each student with a temperature check in the morning. I know that that doesn't necessarily um, eliminate all the risks, but um, it's one big step to mitigating some of the risk. You know, we've advised our uh, college students, uh, and I don't know how effective it's going to be or not, uh, for them and for their families to not have large group gatherings at least until we can get the community spread numbers down to a reasonably low number. And it has nothing to do, frankly, with what's going on on the college campus. It has much more to do with the fact that if you get 10, 12, 15 people together, and if you look at the prevalence rates in some of our communities, you're really asking for risk, particularly on some of the older or, you know, more vulnerable parts of the, uh, of the family. And so we'd like to... Uh, uh, you know, there's no real good science around this today, but we would like to get the first month of back to campus under our belt and to know things are pretty stable, uh, and then let these families make a decision, you know, what they want to do. By that time, we'll be well into flu season, and we're going to be, you know, really pushing flu vaccine really hard uh, this year, you know, even harder than we normally would. Uh, you know, I always get my flu vaccine on video, uh, you know, and so we, we've always find a student that is willing to uh, uh, immunize the chancellor, which is always uh, an interesting experience. <laughs> uh, but, you know, uh, you, you know, you, you got to, you know, walk the walk and talk the talk at the same time. Mm -hmm. But uh, hopefully that combination of things will allow us to get back to school safely. I think a lot of people are hoping for that. Dr. Gilson, really appreciate having you tonight for this discussion as well. We know that big decisions are being made over the next couple weeks. We're going to go to the phones. Our next caller is joining us from North Carolina. John, thanks for joining the conversation. Go right ahead. Thank you, gentlemen, for your, your share, sharing your time and expertise with us this evening. I've heard a lot about what they call herd immunity, and it seems like that is key in helping us get through this pandemic in the long run. And I'm just wondering, what exactly is that? And if it depends on exposure to the virus, are the protocols about mask wearing going to be delaying that? John, herd immunity... Uh, actually goes back to the days of smallpox and even before <clears throat> when one could make a calculation of what percent of the population would have to be immune to stop the transmission of the virus. And it is based upon what's called the transmission or the reproduction uh, factor of the virus. And as this graphic indicates, the idea being is that if I get sick, and the people surrounding me are immune, they can't transmit it to other people. Otherwise, it's sort of like dominoes falling. One transmit to two, two transmit to four, four transmit to eight, et cetera. So given everything we know about COVID-19, uh, the r naught, the uh, reproduction factor, uh, is about two, or which means roughly, or maybe even as high as three, so that means we would need to have immunity of somewhere between half and two-thirds of the entire population in a community. So like we're talking about the Blair School District tonight. That would mean that two-thirds of the people would have to be immune. So in the United States, just to put that into, a, a, you know, into real numbers, that would mean between 200 and 250 million people in the United States would have to be immune. 
Now, in the absence of a vaccine, that means that if 10 or 15 percent are going to get popular, are going to get hospitalized, that means we're talking about hospitalizing something on the order of, uh, you know, 25 million people in the United States, of which 5 million are probably going to not survive this, particularly because of the age group demographics. Now, you know, we're at about 140,000 deaths right now. I mean, we cannot get there through herd immunity without a vaccine, without having a huge amount of hospitalization uh, and death. I'm not saying that the, ex the extent of the transmission of the virus won't help us move towards herd immunity, but to say that we're going to depend on that in the absence of a vaccine, or certainly in the absence of a good antiviral treatment, uh, would really be, uh, you know, we'd be kidding each other. You know, let's talk a little bit about that fatality rate, the number of deaths that have been happening per day. I know that you brought a graphic to come and demonstrate this for us, Dr. Gold, but has that fatality rate really been dropping off? Yeah, it's been going down quite a bit. And, uh, and what you see here is that this is the uh, deaths per day uh, in the United States. Going back to, you know, March, when we first started to see uh, any hospitalization and any death uh, in the United States. As you see, uh, we peaked with the number of daily deaths. And you notice there's actually a weekly cycle to it. And that's not that people are choosing not to die on the weekends. It's just that the reporting occurs usually on a weekday and, and not on a weekend. I only wish that that were the case, that people didn't die uh, seven days a week. But you see, we peaked uh, at the number of deaths per day uh, back in early May. And then it went down through June and into early July. And then following the 4th of July weekend, we started to see an increase in the number of deaths per day. And that's what I was referring to uh, earlier, Christina, in that uh, while the number of cases has substantially risen during much of this period from late June uh, into July, we're now starting to see that reflected in hospitalization rates and unfortunately in fatality rates as well. Just underscores the fact that even though we know more and more about the virus, we're starting to develop more effective treatments such as remdesivir and other new treatments that are on the horizon. We still have not been able to blunt the death rate and we're still talking about thousands of deaths per day uh, as a result of this. And you know, I've had friends, uh, you know, that I worked with for many years, particularly in the New York area. Uh, and, and elsewhere across the country, uh, you know, who are in a senior age group, who were hospitalized, uh, who were in intensive mm -hmm. care, who were on a ventilator, and actually a small number have actually passed away directly related mm -hmm. uh, to the COVID infection. So to me, it's extremely personal. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so when we talk about how you can protect yourself and protect others, uh, it's more than just an academic fact. It's about what we can really do. Great question, though, John. Really appreciate that question. We know that a lot of people are putting a lot of thought into this. And Dr. Gold, just to reiterate what you said earlier, you are more confident on the vaccine side than the therapeutic side. So that's interesting as well. And we really appreciate getting a chance to follow up with you each and every week. I want to kind of bring it back to education as we kind of start to close here. First and foremost, Dr. Gelson, thank you to you and all the educators out there, we know that it has not been easy for our teachers. They have had to work late. It's not an easy job to begin with. So we want to sincerely say thank you. We respect the work that you do, right along with Dr. Gold and the medical community. Now, we've been using the word safely, but can we actually reopen our schools safely? Or at some point, are we just jumping into the deep end of the pool to see what happens? I think a lot of us feel like we might be going into this experimental period. Well, I think a lot depends on local risk factors and local situations. Um, you know, for example, I, and we talked about it before, if there's a high number of COVID cases within a community or if COVID is starting to spread within a school building or in a school district, then what we're using in our district in partnership with local health departments is a risk dial to kind of determine um, what risk level our county um, is in, our, our community is in, and then we've taken proper precautions accordingly. 
Um, so I'm thankful and grateful for UNMC, Dr. Gold, all the support that they provided school districts in Nebraska. And I, I think it really depends on working closely with your local health department um, to assess the risks that are available. Um, and then again, it goes back to the, um, the procedures that could be set up ahead of the school year. I know that some school districts are delaying the start of um, having all students come back. Um, and I think it's just important to make um, you know, a research-based, factual, local decision um, before uh, putting students or families at risk. Well, the work our teachers, our educators, our superintendents across the country are doing right now and have done over the past six months, nothing short of heroic. And like I said, we have the ultimate gratitude for you. We only have a few minutes left. Dr. Gold, do you have some final thoughts for our viewers tonight? Uh, you know, I, I do, Christina. First of all, I'd like to also uh, thank Dr. Gilson and thank all of the superintendents, the educators, uh, for their incredible amount of work and dedication in this area. There is no question that the partnership that we enjoy here in Nebraska with the governor's office, the local public health department, the university, is incredibly effective. And I think that, you know, this is going to make it as safe as possible. But what I would tell our audience tonight is pretty simple. If we want our children to go back to school, and we all want our children to go back to, whether it's K-12, preschool, <clears throat> universities, uh, if we want to get that to that situation to help restore our economy, and by the way, to keep their education and their socialization going firm and going strong, we have to take ownership of this. And that means practice physical distancing, wear face masks, make sure we wash our hands, sanitize surfaces, all of the things that we know that we have to do. We now all collectively own this. And if we want our kids to go back to school, we have to make it happen. And that inconsistent messaging, if you could just address that, say you walk into a store, you are the only person wearing a mask. Address that situation, if you will, Dr. Gold. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I wear my mask all the time. Uh, I mean, I'm sitting uh, six feet or more apart from Dr. Gilson right now and uh, about a thousand miles away from you, Christina. But uh, I wear my mask all the time. Uh, we need to just get that social uh, distancing and that face protection uh, to be consistent. And the messaging uh, has been inconsistent. You know, it's, it's not the, the inconsistency is not about whether it's good practice. The inconsistency is whether it's a mandate or not. So what individuals are saying widely across the country in some, in some states and in, in other areas is it's up to you and it's up to me as an individual. I've already told you what my choices are. Uh, I carry my mask with me. I, I'm very proud to display it widely. Uh, and, uh, and every time I get a chance to talk to anybody, uh, it's always the same message. I want my kids and grandkids to go back to school. I'm going to wear a mask. I love it. You know, we want the economy to turn around for our farmers and ranchers as well. We want to keep our communities safe. That's why we wear masks. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Superintendent of Blair Community Schools in Nebraska, Dr. Randy Gilson. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like more resources on the COVID-19 outbreak, you can head to NebraskaMed.com slash COVID-19. And we will be back here for you next Monday. Get your questions ready. You can also leave us a voice recording at 855-776-6147 and leave us your question at your convenience. Thank you so much for joining us. Rural America will be back here next Monday. More Rural Health Matters. In the meantime, wishing you and your family a beautifully blessed evening.